Well, um, we're still discussing Acts, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, part 76. That's what we're still discussing. And we are moving to the third part of um, part 76. So far, we have discussed how the early church met needs among themselves. So much so that the Bible records that there was no lack in their midst. In our discussion, we also saw how they acted, as it were, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and sold assets. They sold their assets um, so that they could meet needs in the church. That was in the early day, in the early church days. No one compelled them. No one cajoled them. No one shamed them or cursed them into giving. They voluntarily did. They, they saw it as a responsibility to sell off their property and meet needs. In um, Luke chapter Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, the Bible tells us something that the Lord Jesus Christ said. Let me read it from verse 22. Uh, let me put it on the screen. Uh, Luke chapter 12 from part 22, from verse 22 rather. And um, it says, Then he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor, nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of those, one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have. These are things they heard. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. So these are the things that they heard and they acted in that manner and said, look, this is what it is about. We can sell what we want to sell. The Lord said we should sell and give arms. So they sold their assets. We have seen that the early church was able to achieve this because of their spiritual state. They were not just born again. They were sanctified. And they continually were sanctified. So much so that they listened to what the Spirit of God was saying. No wonder when Ananias tried his deception, which we shall be seeing, uh, I think maybe uh, some weeks from now, in Acts chapter 5, Peter said to him in, in verse 3, he said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Because their heart was usually filled by the Spirit of God. But Ananias had allowed his heart to be filled with, by Satan. And now he was saying what he had no business saying. He, he came up with a, a lie, with a deception to deceive the Holy Spirit and to deceive uh, Peter uh, and the others. So going further, we've also seen the scriptural imperative for giving. 
as well as what acceptable giving before the Lord is, which is what we discussed last week. We said we are to give generously, that is give freely, give willingly. We are to give bountifully. We are to give cheerfully. We are to give purposefully. We are to give as God has blessed us, not just financially, but we look at the sum total of what the Lord has done in our lives and we give accordingly. We are to give to the needy. We are to give to widows. We are to give to uh, the fatherless. We are to give to strangers. We are to give to the needy, to people who, who need, who, who have needs. We give to them. Then, um, we also said that we are to give to those who labor in the world. We are to give to ministers of the gospel. Those people who are laboring in the world. We are to give to them. And then we said that we are to give anonymously. That is, we are not to give for show. We are to give anonymously. We are to give in a manner that will not uh, be for, 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 for people to recognize that we are giving. And then we concluded by noting that God will not accept what he has not first given to us. It is what he has first given to us that he receives from us. Indeed, in the case of um, uh, Abraham, when he asked Abraham to give Isaac, it was because he was the one that gave Abraham Isaac. He didn't ask for Ishmael because he didn't, he didn't give Abraham Ishmael. It was what he had given that he was asking for. So it is what he has given to us that is asking us to give to him. He doesn't ask us to give to him what he didn't first give us. God does not ask you to go and steal money and bring. He does not, does not ask you to go and prostitute your body and bring. No. It is what he has given us in form of when we labored and we got uh, a pay or whatever it is that we did and we got paid, God gave to us. And that is what God is asking us to give. Now, we want to discuss today. Uh, let's go back to our, our text now, our, our text which, which I've been looking at. Acts chapter 4. And we'll be reading 32, 34 to 32, and then 34 to 35. Acts chapter 4, 32, and 34 to 35. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Nor was there, verse 34 now, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of land sold them and brought them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. So that's what we've been, that's the scripture we've been looking at and which we'll continue to look at. Now we had said earlier that we're going to discuss um, meeting needs in the church under three headings. We have discussed so far two. The first one was that there may be no lack in our midst. The second one is the doctrine, that is the teaching and lifestyle of giving. And now we move on to the third in our discussion today. So today we'll be looking at meeting needs in the church. Part 3, Meeting Needs in the Church, Part 3, The Place of Tithes and Tithing in the Church Today. The Place of Tithes and Tithing in the Church Today. That is Meeting Needs in the Church, Part 3, The Place of Tithes and Tithing in the Church Today. Today, the, the, the church has tried to deal with meeting needs in the church in, um, you know, in, in, in their own way. Um, they've used, they've come up with all, all manner of systems. And uh, one of the things they've really tried to use is the system of tithe. Now, some have even gone to the extent of using several approaches to ensure compliance in tithing by essentially quoting Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 12. Uh, why, why are you, you this whole assembly he said, shall a man rob God? This whole assembly, you have robbed me. You will tie in, in, your paying, in, in not paying your tithes and your offering. He said, bring all the tithes into the, into the storehouse. Let there be meat in the storehouse of God. And um, see if I will not rebuke the devourer on your account 
and open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. You not have room enough to me. So we've they've used this. We've used the scriptures. Even I have preached from it before to ensure that people comply with tithing. Then there are other approaches that are being used. Some are giving people tithe numbers. Uh, one church, particularly now, I think I believe some other churches are doing it also. You come with your tithe on a on a worship day, and um, you you hold it. You come to the front of the altar. They call you out. You come with your tithe. They pray for you, and then you drop your tithe in the in the uh, bag or whatever it is they have there, and um, and then um, there are also um, those who I, I think there are some other things that they do when it comes to issue of tithing. Anyway, the bottom line is a lot of emphasis has been played placed on the issue of tithing so that. Uh, this there can be compliance in the church. Then there are those of the other side who insist that any pastor who collects tithe is a thief. And um, they've also used the scriptures to, you know, prove their, their point. So in the midst of all these talks of tithes and tithing, we want to look at the word of God and uh, discuss the place of tithe and tithing in the church of God today. Now, I want to stress that the church of God today is a New Testament concept, is the New Testament concept of a group of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, people who have been born again, people who, have, who are sanctified, people who are being sanctified. So, basically, the question we want to address is, should the tithe apply to the New Testament body, to the New Testament believer, should the tithe apply? So that's basically what we want to discuss today. Now, the word tithe simply means a tenth. That's what it means, a tenth of your income. It is mentioned seven times in the New Testament. The focus is on the New Testament. It is mentioned seven times in the New Testament. It is mentioned in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It's mentioned in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. It's mentioned in Luke chapter 18, verse 12. It's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, verse 6, verse 8, and verse 9. Seven times it's mentioned in the New Testament. And so we want to look at these mentions of tithe and see what it's really saying. And then we'll draw our conclusion. Um... The first three, that is in the Gospels, Matthew 23, Luke 11, 42, and Luke 18, verse 10, or verse 12, rather, were things that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, spoke about. So let's go to the scriptures and look at um, these verses of scripture. So we look at Matthew 23, verse 23 first. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, in which the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to the Pharisees. In verse 23 of Matthew 23, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So what he's saying here, let's take the parallel verse in Luke chapter 11, and then we'll discuss what the Lord Jesus Christ is emphasizing here. Luke eleven forty-two, 42, which is a parallel uh, scripture, but is slightly different. It says, but woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the, other, the others undone. Now, in Luke, he was speaking in the house of a Pharisee. In um, Matthew, he was actually discussing with the people generally and was uh, chastising the Pharisees. Now, the point that we want to note here is that in discussing the matter of tithe with the, or, 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 or as, as per the Pharisees, he made it clear to them that they were, fo they were majoring on the minor and not even mentioning the major. What were the majors? The issues of justice, of mercy, of faith, of love of God. 
He said, you guys have abandoned this. But you, you focus so much on that to the extent that you tithe on leaves. You tithe on herbs. Even the one that God did not require according to the law, you tithe. So what kind of, so what was it? What kind of people are you? You leave the major thing. So we see the Lord saying that there is a major part when it comes to scriptural things. And there is a minor part. And the tithe he put as minor. And the issues of justice, of mercy, of faith, and of love, he put as a major consideration. Now, if we go to uh, Luke chapter 18, again, he was talking, he was, he was here giving a parable of two people who had gone before God to pray. And he spoke about the Pharisee and said, in, let me read from verse 11. He said, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. This is the other part that is where tithe is mentioned in the gospel. And here again, we see that the Lord was speaking about it in a, in a form that would suggest that the Pharisees were using it as a self-righteous act. A self-righteous act that says that, well, because I'm paying tithe, God will hear my prayers. And he eventually concluded that parable in Luke 18 by saying that of the two men, that is of the Pharisee and the publican, who did not as much as, who had no credential, but said, Lord, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. He said, that man went to his home justified. But the Pharisee who was trying to justify himself by mentioning fasting and tithing went without being justified by God. And we know that it is the justification of God that counts. That is what matters the most. So in the place, in the places where the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned tithing, we will see that it was in, 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 um, as, as a way of a rebuke against the Pharisees who were paying so much attention to it and ignoring the weightier matters of the law. Now, we go to Hebrews. I Hebrews uh, chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And I'm going to read from verse 1. Uh, I, I actually want to read it. Let me read it here first. And then we'll look at it in the Living Bible and you'll see what is actually seen. Because it's difficult to picture what is being said if you read the New King James. So I read from verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, that is the tithe, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Please, just bear with me and we'll, we'll continue here. I'll explain a few things uh, later. Now, consider how great this man was, that's this Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. He said, this guy must, be, must have been very great. And in verse 5, it says, And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes. Note, it's a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, received tithe from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Melchizedek was not of the genealogy of the priests, and yet he received tithe from Abraham, and he blessed Abraham. And in verse 7 it says, Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better, or the greater. Now in verse 8, it says, Here, in this place, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithe, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So, please, what is happening here is that 
the writer of Hebrews was writing to Jewish Christians, that is Hebrews, who had become Christians and who wanted to continue with the Old Testament rites. And so he was telling them that, look, there is more to, the old, to, to, to this new life than all these your rituals that you're coming with. In, we don't have time to go through it in its context. In chapter 1 of Hebrews, he mentions, he said, God, who at sundry times had spoken to us by, our, uh, by, by the prophets, who spoke to our ancestors by the prophets, is in this generation, in this time, speaking to us by his son, the only begotten son of God. He's speaking to us by that begotten son, who is everything, is the, is the spitting image of the father. And then he continues to say that the angels, whom the Pharisees regarded as very uh, significant things, he said the angels are under Christ. The angels are not greater than Christ. And then by the time you get to chapter 3, he mentions that even Moses, who is considered a lawgiver, is not greater than Christ. That Moses is indeed built the tabernacle, but the builder is not greater than the owner of the house. And after dealing with the issue of Moses, he then comes to the priesthood of Aaron and says, the priesthood of Aaron cannot be compared to the priesthood of Christ, which is after the order of Melchizedek as was prophesied in the book of the Psalms. I think that's Psalm 110, where it says, the, the, God, has given you, God has made you a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And that is what brings about this, to this issue of Melchizedek here. In fact, if you get to chapter 5, there was a break. Because as he continued to speak about Melchizedek, the writer of Hebrews now says, look, there has, there's a lot I would have loved to say, but I can't say it because you are dull of hearing. For the time when you ought to be taught the word of God, you need someone to still, uh, for the time when you ought to be teaching, rather, the word of God, you need someone to still be teaching you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And then it goes on in chapter 6 to speak about the, 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 the foundational doctrines of Christ. So he now comes, after discussing all of that, to chapter 7 and mentions this issue. Now, let me read it. In, um, let me read it in um, the Living Bible Translation. I will, I, I, I will put that up also. Uh, Living Bible Translation. It says, This Melchizedek, and I want us to understand it now. It says, This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of the Most High God. When Abraham was returning home, after winning a great battle against many kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had won in the battle and gave it to Melchizedek. Melchizedek means, Melchizedek's name means justice. So he is the king of justice and is also the king of peace because of the name of his city, Salem, which means peace. Melchizedek had no father or mother. And there's no record of any of his ancestors. He was never born. And he never died. But his life is like that of the son of God. A priest forever. So that's what he was trying to say in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. That this Melchizedek is actually Christ. That's the point he was trying to make. He's actually the Lord Jesus Christ. Because who is it that is, that is on earth, that is without father, without mother? That did not die, that, did not, that, 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 that nobody knows his origin. And yet he's a king. He's the king of Salem. He's, and Salem is, the, is peace, a king of peace. Who, who is that person if he's not the Lord Jesus Christ? Anyway, we now go to verse 4 in Hebrews chapter 7 of Living Bible. He says, see then how great this Melchizedek is. Note, he's discussing the greatness of Melchizedek. The greatness of the priesthood of Melchizedek over the priesthood of Aaron, which collected tithes. So he says here, A, even Abraham, the first and most honored of all God's chosen people, gave Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils he took from the king he had been fighting, from the kings he had been fighting. One could understand why Abraham would do this if Melchizedek had been a Jewish priest. For later on, 
God's people were required by law to give gifts to help their priests because the priests were their relatives. But Melchizedek was not a relative and yet Abraham paid him. B, he's talking of the greater of Melchizedek. So number one is Melchizedek is so great because Abraham gave him tithe. B, Melchizedek placed a blessing upon mighty Abraham. And as everyone knows, a person who has the power to bless is always greater than the person he blesses. So he's speaking of the greatness of Melchizedek's priesthood. And by that, uh, by that reference, also referring to the greatness of Christ over Aaron, the priest of Aaron and everything. C, the Jewish priests, though mortal, receive tithes. But we are told that Melchizedek lives on. So he's greater than the, the, the Aaronic priest because he continues to live. He didn't die, just like Christ. D, one might even say that Levi himself, the ancestor of all Jewish priests, of all who received tithes, paid tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham. Meaning that Melchizedek is greater than even Levi. The Aaronic, of which you have the Aaronic priesthood. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham when Abraham paid the tithes to Melchizedek. So he said even the Aaronic priesthood, they, they honored Melchizedek. They recognized the greatness of Melchizedek's priesthood, of which is Christ. Verse 11 now. E, if the Jewish priests and their laws had been able to save us, why then did God need to send Christ as a priest with the rank of Melchizedek? Instead of sending someone with the rank of Aaron. The same rank all other priests had. So let's continue to read now in the Living Bible. And when God sent a new kind of priest, his law must be changed to permit it. So when Christ came, the law had to be changed for Christ to be a priest. As we all know, Christ did not belong to the priest tribe of Levi but came from the tribe of Judah, which had not been chosen for priesthood. Moses had never given them that work. So we can plainly see that God's method changed for Christ. The new high priest who came with the rank of Melchizedek did not become a priest by meeting the old requirements of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but on the basis of power flowing from a life that cannot end. And the psalmist points this out when he says of Christ, you are a priest forever with the rank of Melchizedek. Verse 18. Yes, the old system of priesthood based on family line was cancelled because it didn't work. It was weak and useless for saving people. It never made anyone really right with God. But now we have a far better hope. For Christ makes us acceptable to God, and now we may draw near to him. Praise the name of the Lord. So, this is basically what it is about. That, the, the uh, what do you call it now? The, the discussion about Abraham paying tithe in Hebrews was not a discussion to get us to pay tithe. It was a discussion to show the greatness of Christ over and above all the people that the Jews had believed to be great. Over Aaron and the priesthood of Aaron, over Levi and the Levites generally, and that particular order, over even the law. That was the point. And then he now emphasized the fact that we are dealing with a new covenant, a new testament. Now, this is where many people actually make the mistake when we talk of um, uh, what's it called now? The, the, the New Testament or the Old Testament. We look at the documents of the Bible and refer to New Testament and Old Testament because they are the document. The word testament as used in the Bible has three, is one of three meanings. The first one is the will of God. The second one is the uh, document of the Bible. The third one is covenant. So the first one, the will of God, the will of God has never changed. 
So the will of God is not old. Therefore, Old Testament is not talking about an old will of God. It's talking about the will of God. Across board, whether it was old or new, is the will of God. The second one, which is a document, which is the document of the old or the new, is referring to the document of the Bible, the Old Testament portion and the New Testament portion. And those are documentations of events that took place which included the Word of God and included historical things, which meant that God did not have to tell a lie there. If Satan said something, God would say Satan said this, but it didn't mean that God said it. Yet we refer to those things as God's Word. Now, the third one is the covenant. Now, there, there is a new covenant and there is an old covenant. So what he was saying was that once the old covenant was put in place, under that old covenant, you had tithing as part of the ordinances that the people had to obey. It was commanded. That tithing, tithing was a, 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 a command. At that time. That is under the old covenant. Now we are dealing with a new covenant. And he's saying that that entire thing of the priesthood. Because the tithing came as a result of the priesthood of Aaron. So he's saying that all that system of ordinances and laws. That were attached during the time of Aaron were cancelled when a new covenant was put in place. And under this new covenant, we now have only one high priest, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says that we all are a kingdom of priests. In cancelling the, 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 the ordinances of the old covenant, everything associated with that covenant was taken away, including the time. So, let's draw our conclusion after all this, and then we'll now see what is being said here. Number one, when tithe is mentioned in the New Testament, it is always in relation to natural Israel. Never spiritual Israel. Never. It has never been mentioned in relation to spiritual So, when we mentioned, when we saw in the Gospels, the three places where the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned the issue of tithe, it was in relation to natural Israel, the Pharisees particularly. When we, see, when we saw the writer of Hebrews mentioning the issue of tithe in Hebrews chapter 7, which just read chapter 7, verse, um, I think it's verse 5, 6, 8, and 9. Again, it was in relation to natural Israel, not spiritual Israel. And don't forget, Hebrews was written to the, the Jews who had become Christians and was actually telling them that all that has been taken away, that there's a new covenant in place, a new testament in place. Because the old one did not help them. The old one did not bring salvation to anybody. The killing of goats and animals brought salvation to no one. He didn't change them. So God brought a new, a new covenant and put that in place. And under that new covenant, we have Christ who supersedes everyone, including the, 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 uh, the ironic uh, priesthood. Secondly, nowhere in the New Testament is it mentioned as a command to Christians to tithe. Nowhere in the New Testament is it ever mentioned as a commandment to uh, New Testament Christians to tithe. Nowhere. Thirdly, nowhere in the is tithe even mentioned as an obligation by Christians. It's not mentioned. Uh, let's, let's go to Acts chapter 15. When they, they had this uh, meeting uh, about dealing with issues in the church about what, what, what and what the church should be doing. You know, remember that time when some people went to Paul and, 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 and when they went to where uh, Paul and Barnabas had been preaching and they began to say that except you are circumcised, you cannot be truly saved, that salvation is not by faith, you also need to be circumcised and so on and so forth. The problem was caused by people who came from Jerusalem. So they took the problem back to Jerusalem and said, we need to solve this problem. You guys, you need to solve it. People from your own place, 
have started going all over the place. So a council met and they began to speak about how to deal with these issues. Eventually, they came up and said, we are going to send a letter to them. That letter will, will summarize what is expected of them as believers. Let's read that letter. I'll just read two verses there. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me, no, let me read a little longer. Okay, let me read from verse 23. Acts 15 from verse 23. It says, they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. Verse 28 now. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Verse 29. That you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. That was all. It, there was no mention of tithing. Even no mention of giving. Number four. The Lord Jesus Christ did not once, once require that his disciples pay tithe. Not once. Remember the occasion when they came and asked him, why are your disciples not fasting? Like the Pharisees fast and we, the disciples of John the Baptist, we also fast. He said, a time will come when they will fast. Right now, I'm with them, so they can't fast. But nowhere did he say, you are, I'm with you now, so don't tithe. When I go, tithe. It's not, it's not written there. Just like he never one day celebrated his birthday. Not once did the Lord Jesus Christ celebrate the birthday. Not once did he say to them, when I have gone, celebrate my birthday. Not once. But what are we doing today? We are celebrating birthday. That's what we are doing. We have brought in Christmas. But he said, Celebrate my death. As often as you do this, you show that I died and resurrected and I'm coming back again. That was the essence. But we have turned communion into something else. It was to serve as a reminder because we always forget. And today we are forgetting because we are using communion as something else. We are using communion for healing and other things. We were communion was something that we would gather together and commune together as, as believers with the Spirit of God and remind ourselves that Jesus is coming back. That he went. He died for our sins. He, raised, he was raised for our justification. And that he's returning again. But like mere mortals that we are, we continue to do things as we like. The Lord just never asked anybody to do that. But we are the ones doing it. And we keep doing it as we like. Every day we do whatever it is that we like. We come up with new, with new things and lay claim that they, somebody received a revelation. And I thank God Paul wrote in, 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 in Galatians chapter 1, says, if anybody comes and tells that they received a revelation, even if it's an angel, let that angel be accursed. So we need to be careful. Number five, none of the apostles required tithing or the tithes of any Christian. Not one. Not one of them. We didn't read in Acts that said, okay, 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 you know, this issue of um, our gathering money is not helping us. I think what we need to do now is basically, let's, let's put in place what, what they used to do under the old covenant. Let's start tithing. They didn't say that. Instead, they they they, they let me read, let me read uh, 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 1 to 18, what Paul wrote. He writes, says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus our Lord? The, the, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? As do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Kephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Or do I say these? Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out of the ground, out it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? I want you to listen. Oh. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But I have used none of these. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with the stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. I read this long passage because I want to prove a point here. For as much as he speaks about taking care of uh, preachers and other things, he never once mentioned the issue of tithing. Not once. He mentioned the issue of receiving of your material things, yes, but he never mentioned it as a, as a matter of law, as a matter of command or tithe. No. So not one of the apostles mentioned the issue of tithe or tithing. That brings me to point number six as we conclude. Does that preclude or exonerate Christians from acting responsibly? No. Nobody is saying that you should not act responsibly and contribute to the upkeep of those who minister the gospel. It is, it is this issue of upkeep, maybe next week by the grace of God, when we look at some of the historical antecedents that may have given rise to this, we will see that a lot of people are acting irresponsibly. And because they're acting responsibly, men are trying to orchestrate a way by which they will force or compel people to be responsible. You have to be responsible. If indeed the Spirit of God is in you, it is expected that you will act responsibly. That is why we thought you are to give generously without anybody compelling you or cajoling you. You are to give bountifully as God has blessed you. You are to give cheerfully. You are to give purposefully. You should purpose in your heart. For example, you could purpose and say, every month I want to give a tenth to God. That is okay. It is not, it's, it's not like tithe where you are forced, where you are compelled. No. It's your decision. I want to give God 20% of my income every month. Maybe as your income increases, you say, I want to give to God 
or forty percent or fifty percent. That is a personal. Nobody is forcing you. There is no law. That's the point we are trying to make here. But you must act responsibly. We also said you should give as God has blessed you, not just financially. But as God has blessed you in other areas, you are to give to widows, to the fatherless, to strangers, to the needy. You are to give to ministers of the gospel. One does not expect you to now say, for example, maybe at a time you were earning a particular amount, you were given a tenth. Later, as God increases you, you can say, ah, in fact, what I have now is so much, I can give 20%. I can give 30%. You are not under compulsion. It is your decision. It's between you and God. You do it anonymously. Nobody needs to know what you are doing. That's between you and God. You are not compelled in scripture under the new covenant to pay tithe. You are not. That's the simple truth. But you are also not exonerated from acting responsibly in meeting needs in the church, that is, of the, of, 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 of the body of Christians. You should meet the needs of the widows. You should meet the needs of the fatherless. You should meet the needs of those who, need, who have needs. You should meet the needs of ministers. I didn't say wants. I said the needs, the essentials, the basic necessities. Not wants, not desires. Not what we desire to have an aircraft, so you go and buy aircraft. That's not what we're talking about. We are now no longer under law, but under grace. Under the law, you were compelled, you were commanded. Under grace, you are not compelled, you are not commanded. And recall, we had said, I think two weeks ago, that giving is said to be a grace of God. So if indeed you are under the grace of God, it is expected that you will give of your material substance to make sure that there is no lack in the church, to make sure that those who minister the gospel are taken care of. You don't have to wait for a pastor to beg you for money before you know that you should send something to the pastor. You don't have to wait for the pastor to spend six months teaching on something that is not scriptural like tithe before you give. It is because of this on our own unscriptural behavior that pastors are now bringing on scriptural methods to collect. But those things are wrong. If you are a Christian, sanctify. The Spirit of God is in you. You should know the right thing to do. That's the simple truth. You should know the right thing to do and do it. But we have a situation where people don't give I've seen people where once they pay their tithe, they believe they are because they see it as, oh, I've, I've, done, I've done what is right, what I'm supposed to do. That's it. Then they start giving 50 naira, 100 naira, 500 naira as offering. They say, I've, I've given tithe. It is this kind of teaching that has turned us into selfish people. It's this kind of teaching that has shut our hearts from the needs of others. We have come, we have not realized that there are needs that and we are meant to meet those, we are obligated to meet those needs. This is not and should not be controversial. That is tithing and tithe. This should, is not and should never be a matter of controversy. It is scripture we are talking about here. There's nothing to do with controversy. The Bible, does, the, the, under the New Testament, we are not told to tithe. It's simple. If you choose that you want to keep giving 10%, nobody can stop you from doing it. Do it. But recognize that it is a free, it's a free will. If you, don't, if you don't tithe, as it's been taught now, it, it, heaven and hell has nothing to do with that. Like the Bible tells us, like we saw in, in Hebrews. It says, this all this... All these ordinances of tithing, of giving, all these ordinances of, 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 of um, sheep, killing sheep. and uh, He wasn't able to save them. 
that if it were, God would never have brought a new one. But God brought a new covenant, and in bringing a new covenant, he canceled everything about the old. Therefore, I submit to us that tithing and tithe has no place in the New Testament church. However, the New Testament Christian is under obligation, not command now, under obligation to meet needs in the New Testament church as we saw in Acts chapter 4. You are, ob you are obligated to do that. Whether it is 50% or 90% you want to give, as God has blessed you, that's your business. You don't even have to show off or, on it. My prayer is that the little that we've said will help us to do what is right and what is needful. By the grace of God, next week, we shall address two principal questions that I think many people will ask Questions like, um, but Abraham paid tithe, and uh, even, even though he paid tithe, it was not, there was no law then. And we know that the law, uh, because he did it out of law, is not abrogated. The law cannot abrogate what Abraham did. Yes, we'll discuss that. And then we'll also try and answer the issue of Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 12. How do you deal with that? We'll try and answer those questions next week by the grace of God. For now, I'm praying that God will grant unto us wisdom, understanding, and clarity of heart so that we can be able to appreciate and understand why God is not insisting on us paying tithe under the new covenant. Why God is giving us a liberty where under the new covenant we are walking by the Spirit of God. Where sometimes the Spirit of God would tell us to even give a hundred percent. Sometimes you, you would say, okay, just give 10 or give 20 or give 30. We, we, are not, we are not boxed in to a regimentation or a regime of 10%. No, we are not. And let us not let us not kill ourselves over the and or kid ourselves thinking. That if I, unless I tithe, I, 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 I will miss heaven. No. Heaven and tithe, they are, there is nothing that tied the two of them together. Nothing that tied the two of them together. Eternity has to do with Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 7, it says, Eternal life is this, that they know you, the Father, and they know me, Christ. That's eternal life. So let's not get ourselves worked up with oh, but it is true because many of us are unable to break from it because we think that it is commanded. Scripture surely is not commanded. I, I will advise you, like the Bereans, do your own reading, do your own study, and then maybe one of these days we'll share notes and you'll see that God did not command these things, God did not ask us to do those things. By the grace of God, next week we'll discuss more. For now, I want you to pray, ask God to give you wisdom. Ask God to grant you understanding concerning that which you have heard. Ask God to help you so that you will understand. Some people will hear this and say, ah, thank God, I'm free from it. No, that's not it. You are going to be, you will, in fact, you're supposed to do more than, 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 than 10%. You're supposed to do more than that, ideally. So don't think that, oh, I'm saying to you that you are, you are free to now live as you like. No, the, the, the Bible doesn't tell us that. Grace does not tell us that we live as we like. Grace tells us that we live soberly, that we live godly and righteously in this present age. So we don't live as we like. We live as the Spirit of God directs us. And then, of course, there's the other extreme that says, ah, no, God, uh, we, we, have, we have to tithe because we are, we are being taught, go and read the Bible and see it for yourself. I am not saying that you should not be involved in giving towards the work of God or to the people who serve God or to the people who need whose needs need to be met within the ambit of the church and even beyond the church. I am saying that we are not commanded to tithe. It's not a command. Tithe does not even feature under the new covenant. So pray and ask God to give you understanding, to give you wisdom. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of God for it. 
the word of God is sacrosanct. My words are not, but the word of God is sacrosanct. I am merely a messenger, and I want to believe God that he would minister to you himself. There's something that um, Paul mentioned in Philippians, I think it's Philippians chapter 3 or so. Yes, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse, verse 16. Or let me read from verse 15. It says, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, verse 16 now, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So let's not get caught up with, oh, this is what uh, they are saying, this is what they are doing and things like that. No. Let's understand that God has said certain things and let's walk as God wants us to walk. There is a purpose in all of this and God will reveal it to your hearts. Let us pray as we close. Eternal Rock of Ages, I want to thank you for utterance. I want to thank you for that which we have spoken and shared from your word. I pray, Lord, that as many as have heard, you will minister wisdom, understanding, even by your spirit to their hearts, that they will be, it will be, the spirit of God will bear witness within their spirits that indeed this is the word of God. I pray, Almighty and everlasting God, that they will also look at the scriptures themselves and discuss with you and that you will let them know that indeed you did not require men and women under the new covenant to pay tithes or to tithe. But that they are supposed to act responsibly and meet needs in the church and give as you have blessed them. Thank you everlasting Father. Blessed be your name almighty God. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.